in the history of church music. Fanny Crosby stands out as the queen of gospel hymns. Born in 1820, she became blind at just six weeks old. Rather than hinder her, blindness gave Fanny an ear for rhythm and an opportunity for education. She believed that God had ordained her blindness for His glory. By the time of her death in 1915, Fanny Crosby had written more than 8,000 hymns, many of which are still sung today. God bless your dear hearts. I'm so happy to be here. I want to tell you some things that God has done in my life. You must know first off that I have been blind since I was six weeks old. A doctor treated my inflamed eyes with a hot poultice and spoiled my eyes. The poor doctor soon disappeared from the neighborhood and we never heard any more about him. He's probably dead before this time, but if I could ever meet him, I would tell him that unwittingly he did me the greatest favor in the world. I've heard that this physician never ceased expressing his regret at the occurrence and that it was one of the sorrows of his life. But if I could meet him now, I would say thank you, thank you over and over again for making me blind. Why would I not have this doctor's mistake, if a mistake it was, remedied? Well, there are many reasons, and I will tell you some of them. One is that I know that although it may have been a blunder on the physician's part, it was no mistake of God's. I verily believe that it was his intention that I should live my days in physical darkness so as to be better prepared to sing his praises and incite others to do so. I could not have written thousands of hymns, many of which, if you'll pardon me for repeating it, are sung all over the world. If I had been hindered by the distractions of seeing all the interesting and beautiful objects that would have been presented to my notice. Do you think my childhood was any different than yours? I helped with the household chores. I learned to sew, knit, and crochet. I played all the usual games with the neighborhood children, climbed trees, and rode horseback. My grandmother taught me to identify the birds, the flowers, and the trees. She read to me and help me to memorize scripture and poetry. I like to write little verses of my own and the county paper published one of my early works. <clears throat> oh, what a happy child I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. So weep or sigh because I'm blind? I cannot, nor I won't. I went to school with the other children, and although I could play any game the other children played, I could not learn in the same way. The teacher could not give me the help I needed, but I wanted to learn, and more than anything, I wanted to be useful. Often, when such circumstances as these made me very blue and depressed, I would creep off alone, kneel down, and ask God if, though blind, I was not one of his children, if in his great world he had not some little place for me. And it often seemed that I could hear him say, Do not be discouraged, little girl. You shall someday be happy and useful, even in your blindness and I would go back amongst my associates, cheered and encouraged, and feeling that it would not be very long before my life would be full of activity and usefulness. I also prayed, Dear God, please show me how I can learn like other children. And finally, when I was 14, there came the happiest day of my life. My mother produced a circular from the New York Institution for the Blind, sent her by an acquaintance. As she read the announcement, I clapped my hands and exclaimed, 
Oh, thank God, he has answered my prayer, just as I knew he could. A few months later, in March 1835, just before my 15th birthday, I was on my way to Manhattan. The education of the blind was a new thing in those days. People thought that blindness or any physical limitation meant one must be unproductive and dependent. So the institution was a bit of a curiosity, an experiment in what was possible. We took every opportunity to prove that the education of the blind was indeed worthwhile. Presidents, statesmen, talented and famous people would visit. And when they did, I was always ready with a tribute in poetry to welcome them. I became the poet in residence, so to speak. Many of us had the opportunity to travel, to advertise the school, and to demonstrate our abilities. We floated to Niagara Falls on the Erie Canal and visited Washington, D.C. to champion the cause of the blind. I was always included on such trips to recite my poetry. And before 1840, my friends had nearly spoiled me with their praises. Or at least, I began to feel my importance as a poet a little too much. And one morning after breakfast, I was summoned to the office. And thinking that Mr. Jones would ask me for a poem, or perhaps give me some word of commendation, as he sometimes did, I obeyed at once. But instead of more praise and a new commission to write verses, I found a plain talk awaiting me. It was an impressive occasion, and I remember what Mr. Jones said, almost word for word. Fanny, I'm sorry you've allowed yourself to be carried away by what others have said about your verses. True, you have written a number of poems of real merit, yet how far do they fall short of the standard you might attain? Shun a flatterer, Fanny, as you would a viper. No true friend would deceive you with words of flattery. Remember that whatever talent you possess belongs wholly to God and that you ought to give him the credit for all that you do. Mr. Jones was a fine teacher of the young and he knew just what was best in my particular case. After giving me a little more advice, he said, now we will reconstruct the fabric, but on a different plan. You have real poetic talent, yet it is crude and undeveloped. And if your talent ever amounts to much, you must smooth and polish your verses so that they may be of more value. Store your mind with useful knowledge and and the time may come when you will attain the goal toward which you have already made some progress. Then the dear man said to me, Fanny, have I wounded your feelings? Something within me bore witness that Mr. Jones spoke the truth. And so I said, no, sir, on the contrary, you have talked to me like a father and I thank you very much for it. I tried to heed Mr. Jones's advice, and as the years went by, I published my first book of poetry and changed from student to teacher. But life really changed in the summer of 1848. Vague rumors of Asiatic cholera came to our ears. By autumn, the dread disease had swept all over Europe slaying its thousands and putting the inhabitants of the infected cities into a panic. That winter was favorable to the spread of cholera and a mild, damp, muggy atmosphere prevailed. And the physicians in our city began to predict that we were certain to be visited by the terrible scourge within the year. The cholera reached New York in the spring of 1849. 10 of our pupils became ill and succumbed to the malady. 
I very nearly thought I had it myself one evening. I didn't say a word to anyone, but I took a generous dose of the pills that I had been helping to make and went to bed. In the morning, all seemed well, but these sad events had left their mark and weighed heavily on my heart. Sometime after this, I had a dream that a dear friend was dying, and in the dream he asked me, Will you meet me in heaven? Yes, I will, God helping me, I replied. And I thought his last words were, Remember, you promise a dying man. Then the clouds seemed to roll from my spirit, and I awoke from the dream with a start. I could not forget those words. Will you meet me in heaven? And although my friend was perfectly well, I began to consider whether I could really meet him or any other acquaintance in the better land, if called to do so. In the autumn of 1850, there was a series of revival meetings being held at the 30th Street Methodist Church. Some of us went down every evening and on two occasions, I sought peace at the altar, but did not find the joy I craved. Until one evening, November 20th, 1850, it seemed that the light must indeed come then or never. And so I arose and went to the altar alone. After a prayer was offered, they began to sing the grand old consecration hymn. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? And when they reached the third line of the fourth stanza, Here, Lord, I give myself away. My very soul was flooded with a celestial light. I sprang to my feet shouting, Hallelujah! And then, for the first time, I realized that I had been trying to hold the world in one hand and the Lord in the other. It was about a year later that I began working with Mr. George F. Root. You all know Mr. Root, I'm sure. He's written so many popular songs. He had been teaching music at the institution for quite some time and needed some words for his melodies. We wrote 50 or 60 songs and two cantatas together. Our most enduring song has been, There's Music in the Air. There's music in the air When the infant born is nigh And faint its blush is seen On the bright and laughing sky Many a harp's ecstatic sound thrills us with its joy profound while we list enchanted there to the music in the air. Well, there was still some time before I would meet Mr. William Bradbury, who would ask me to write the words to my first hymn. Prior to 1864, I'd never met this gifted composer but by 1860, he had become very well known. Now, I'd often fancied that our taste might be congenial, and on this account, I was somewhat anxious to make his acquaintance. Now, by God's providence, a mutual friend of ours encouraged me to meet Mr. Bradbury and provided me with a letter of introduction. In consequence of this arrangement, I presented myself at the offices of William B. Bradbury 425 Broom Street. To my surprise, Mr. Bradbury said, Fanny, I thank God that you, we have la at last met, for I think that you can write hymns, and I have wished for a long time to have a talk with you. <sighs> well, after a brief interview, I promised to bring him something before the week drew to a close. And in three days' time, I returned with some verses that were soon set to music and published as my first hymn. We are going, we are going 
to a home beyond the skies where the fields are robed in beauty and the sunlight never dies where the fount of joy is flowing in the valley green and fair we will dwell in love together there will be no parting there we are going we are going to a home beyond the skies where the fields are robed in beauty and the sunlight never dies. Unfortunately, Mr. Bradbury was not well. And before three years had passed, we sang that very song at his funeral. But others picked up where dear Mr. Bradbury left off, and I soon met another composer under very interesting circumstances. Mr. William Howard Doan and his friend, Dr. Van Meter, were looking for him to be used at a certain anniversary. A number of standard hymns had been given to Mr. Doan, but he did not find them appropriate. At about this time, I had been writing More Like Jesus, and my friend, Dr. Lowry, asked why I did not send it to Mr. Doan. I said, well, I will, and accordingly sent it off by messenger boy. The boy handed my words to Mr. Doan, who was at that very moment speaking with Dr. Van Meter and laid my words aside. When he took them up again and looked over the contents, he started after the boy, but could not find him. So he determined to find me. After searching all day, he was finally directed to my boarding place. He insisted on paying me and asked if I might write another hymn. In the meantime, Dr. Van Meter was growing impatient for his expected hymn. He came to Mr. Doan the next day and said, well, do you have it? Mr. Doan replied, not the music to the words you gave me yesterday, but I have something else, and if we can find an organ, I will play it for you. They went into a neighboring church, and Dr. Van Meter agreed to pump the organ while Mr. Doan played and sang. They had not gone very far, when Dr. Van Meter burst into tears and forgot to pump the organ. They tried again, and this time the good doctor came out from behind the organ, threw his arms around Mr. Doan's neck and cried, Doan, where did you get that? Then Mr. Doan told him that Fanny Crosby had written the words and that he had written the melody. The hymn was used at the anniversary and was a great success. More like Jesus would I be, let my Savior dwell with me, fill my soul with peace and love, make me gentle as a dove. More like Jesus while I go, pilgrim in this world below, poor in spirit would I be, let my Savior dwell in me. Well, by this time, I have written a great number of hymns with Mr. Doan. In one case, Mr. Doan came into my house and said, I have exactly 40 minutes before my train leaves for Cincinnati. Here is a melody. Can you write words for it? Well, I replied that I would see what I could do. Then followed a space of 20 minutes, during which time I was wholly unconscious to all else except the work that I was doing. At the end of that time, I recited the words to safe in the arms of Jesus. Mr. Doan copied them down and had time to catch his train. Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on his tender breast, there by his love o'ershaded, sweetly my soul shall rest. 
Hark, tis the voice of angels born in a song to me over the fields of glory, over the jasper sea. Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on his tender breast, there by his love o'ershaded, sweetly my soul shall rest. We also wrote another hymn together that you may recognize. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. It may seem a little old-fashioned that I always begin my work with prayer, but I never undertake a hymn without first asking the good Lord to be my inspiration in the work that I am about to do, that some of my hymns have been dictated by the blessed Holy Spirit, I have no doubt, and that others are the result of deep meditation, I know to be true. But that the poet has any right to claim special merit for himself is certainly presumptuous. Most of my hymns have been written during the long night watches when the distractions of the day could not interfere with the rapid flow of thought. It has been my custom to hold a little book in my hand, and somehow or other the words seem to come more promptly when I am so engaged. I can also remember more accurately when the little volume is in my grasp. Sometimes a hymn comes to me by stanzas and needs only to be written down, but I never have any portion of a poem committed to paper until the entire poem is composed. Then there is often much pruning and revising necessary before it is really finished. Sometimes it is true, a poem comes as a complete whole and needs no revision. Indeed, the best seem to come that way, but the great majority do not. On one occasion, Mr. Joan had given me the subject Rescue the Perishing. As I have become known as a hymn writer, I have received more and more invitations to speak. I have also become involved with several missions. And one night when I was speaking, the thought kept forcing itself on my mind that some mother's boy must be rescued that very night, or perhaps not at all. And so I said, if there is a dear boy here tonight, who has perchance wandered from his mother's home and his mother's teaching, would he please come to me at the close of the service? A young man of 18 came forward and said, did you mean me? I promised my mother to meet her in heaven, but the way I've been living, I don't think that will be possible now. After we prayed, he rose with a new light in his eyes and he exclaimed in triumph, now I can meet my mother in heaven, for I have found her God. That evening, I wrote the words to rescue the perishing. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep over the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Sometimes a melody suggests the words 
and a hymn almost writes itself. I was visiting with my very good friend, Phoebe Knapp, when she sat down at the piano and began to play a tune she had composed. Once she had played it two or three times, she asked me what it said to me. I replied without hesitation, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And then there was the time I needed five dollars. All of my friends were out of town and I didn't know where I would get it. So I prayed and asked God for five dollars. A little while later there was a knock at the door. A gentleman had come to tell me how much he appreciated my hymns. We spoke a few moments, he shook my hand and departed. When he was gone, I realized he left something in my hand. Exactly five dollars. I felt that God was leading me all the way. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercies, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. Now, as I say farewell, may the Lord watch between me and thee, as we are absent one from the other. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done.